Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. We had uh, some teaching on this Wednesday evening and uh, did about 45 minutes of it. And I didn't even get halfway through. So I said to the uh, our Wednesday night uh, crowd, I told them, I said, well, we're just going to go back to this and possibly do this some other time. Well, this is the some other time Wednesday night. So if you were here Wednesday night, you get a double dose. All right. Double for your trouble. How's that sound? Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Someone shout your bodies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, someone shout one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. Someone shout one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. We're going to uh, minister on the topic, the subject, one body. So if you will, take your neighbor by the hand as a point of contact and a sign of unity. And let's ask God's blessings and favor upon this word. Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful for the reading of your word. We pray that this word will go forth in power and demonstration of your spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. And Holy Spirit, we know you're in this room. We have felt your presence. We ask that you'll continue to lead and guide and direct us. Bring all things back to, uh, uh, to our remembrance, whatsoever has been spoken, whatsoever has been written. Give us insight for our eyesight. Open our ears that we may hear what you are saying to the church. And Father, when we leave this place, we know we'll bear much fruit and we will operate in your gifts. So confirm your word with signs and wonders. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for standing in, re for the, in reverence of the reading of God's word. Well, as I shared Wednesday night, I want to share with you today some fascinating things about the human body. I was telling them our doctor, uh, Dr. Greathouse, who's delivered uh, Levi and Caleb, uh, great man of God. He's doing missionary work in South America. Great man of God. Uh, but he um, was, he was uh, I guess, highlighted in the, in the, in the state news, uh, not only in Arkansas, but I also believe in Texas, where uh, the miracle happened. He, there was a baby that just wasn't, wasn't going to turn just right anyway. And he had prayed for this particular mother and this child, and immediately they watched that the baby just turned. And so he made a lot of news from that. This man uh, attended Oral Roberts University, and he's just a just a great man of God. And uh, we we just it wasn't we were searching him out. It just you know that God just made that connection. You should always pray for your Boaz and Ruth connections, divine appointments. And uh, nevertheless, though, he began to talk to us about the human body. And I love what he had to say as a, as a Christian, as a believer, as a minister. And he said, only God could orchestrate something so amazing, so perfect. Even to the, down to the very detail, the genetic detail of the human body, to the chromosomes, you know, the DNA, the strands, and all the things that take place. Only God is, has that ability to do so. Well, I want to share with you some things, some amazing facts about the human body. And some of these are kind of funny. Some of these are very interesting, though. Did you know that your mouth produces about one liter of saliva each day? And I know you're thinking right now, probably moving your mouth around and thinking, hmm, you know, don't want to get the mad cow disease or something like that, right? Did you know your brain is sometimes more active when you're asleep than when you're awake? And some of you can uh, agree with that, right? Because you probably know some people whose brain's not very active, very inactive. Did you know that laid end to end an adult's blood vessels could circle the Earth's equator four times? 
Wow, that's, an, that's amazing. In fact, the word muscle comes from the Latin term meaning little mouse, which is what ancient Romans thought uh, flex bicep muscles look, resembled. Everybody flex your muscle if you have them. You may have to turn around. I know some of you are like, look at me, I'm, I'm strong. Right? So uh, I'm, Jeremy's back there. and you know, do, Just be careful, Jeremy, when you're doing that. Uh, and so uh, bodies, did you know this? Bodies give off a tiny amount of light that's too weak for the eye to see. That's incredible to think of. And, and God says in his word that we're to let our light so shine. Isn't that amazing? Only God, like I said, has that ability to create such an amazing, amazing feature. The average person has 67 different species of bacteria in their belly button. Go home and get a brush and get to work. Did you know that you lose about 8 pounds, 13 ounces of skin cells every year? 8 pounds. People talking about losing weight. 8 pounds of skin cells every year. Babies don't shed tears until they're at least one month old. I think many of us knew that. Uh, information zooms along nerves about 250 miles per hour. That's incredible. It says the human heart beats more than 3 billion times in an average lifespan. How many would like for that heart to keep beating, right? All of us would. Did you know that your left lung is about 10% smaller than your right lung? Also, human teeth are just as strong as shark teeth. That's something you can think of when you're looking at shark week in a couple of weeks from now. That scientists estimate that the nose can recognize a trillion different scents. Aren't you glad for your nose? <laughs> okay. Did you know your blood makes up about 8% of your body weight? Just the human blood. The body's inter interesting, isn't it? It's fascinating that God has this enormous ability to create something so beautiful yet so complex so amazing and so the body consists of many parts the human body and they all have a form and they all have a function and if you're following along in your bulletin insert you're going to write this in number one each part of your body has a respective office it is designed for that office not another office for that respective office. Number two, each part of the human body, it contributes to the perfection and the support of the whole. So it's not only filling that, that uh, respective office, but it's also contributing. It is the part of the body. It's important. Number three, each part is indispensably necessary in the place which it occupies. It is there for a particular reason. God put it there. There's a reason that it's there, and it has a purpose. Number four, the last one is this. Each part is equally useful, though performing a different function. Equally useful. It is very useful, yet it has different functionality. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about one body, about the body of Christ, as we look at it and reflect upon the human body, the anatomy of our body. And this is interesting that the Apostle Paul would use this metaphor, the human body, one body. So let's ask this question before we get to this next segment. I want to ask you, which part of the human body gets the most attention? In your assessment, in your own opinion, which part of the human body gets most of the attention? Is it the face? Is it the hair? What is it? Maybe if you just think about your particular, your particular body right now, what part of your body gets the most attention? And I, I asked my wife this earlier this week, and I said, you know, what do you think? And she went down the line, and she said, well, the heart and different things. And really, it all depends. It really depends. And I'm going to break this down and show you this today. Because sometimes the part of the body that gets the most attention is the part of the body that hurts the most. So you want to fill that in. It's, the, it's sometimes the one that gets the most attention, the part of the body that gets the most attention is the one that hurts the most. 
could be like your knees and you're spending a lot of a lot of time maybe knee replacement or working on the knees number two sometimes a part of the body that gets the most attention is a part of the body that is not functioning properly maybe the teeth is not working the way it needs to work and you're having problems chewing your food you know and so that's getting some attention you go to the dentist and get that corrected the third thing is this sometimes a part of the body that gets the most attention is a part of the body that is the most visible before you left to come to church this morning you one of the very first things you did was to look in the mirror to make sure every well some of us make sure that our hair was in place okay and if you didn't have a lot of hair well you want to make sure there's no nose hairs right or you want to make sure that your makeup is long and you're not having a makeup line everything's looking good your lipstick is fine or whatever it is okay now let's talk about the ladies okay then whatever you're doing i'm just kidding i hopefully know guys that came in with lipstick but that has happened but nevertheless we'll keep on going i like this though what paul says to the romans in romans 12 and verse 1 he says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies present your bodies a living sacrifice and he tells you how we're to present him I present our bodies it says holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service reasonable service you know sometimes I think God he's not going to ask us to do something that's uh, unreasonable right he gives us grace and he gives us mercy and he's going to ask us to do something that is in our power to do it and so I'm under an impression though when I begin to look at this whole idea of coming to God and presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, I'm under the impression that the body of Christ spends more time on the form of the body than on the function of the body. That we are spending so much energy and effort on what the program may look like than, uh, than spending the effort on the outreach. We spend so much time on making sure the sound system is sounding good and, and there's no flaws in it and everything's in tune, but we rarely spend any time praying with one another. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we're so keyed on the form that we're leaving out the function. And there's something happening there and we need to investigate and examine this and say, okay, God, what is happening? It's amazing to me how quickly we as believers misinterpret scripture. There, there are people who've taken this, perhaps Romans 12 and 1, and they've taken this scripture and they said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, and they become legalistic with this scripture. Presenting your bodies as a living, living sacrifice. They developed it into a dress code. They developed it into the way that one should wear their hair or even amount of jewelry or makeup that one wears. And they use that particular thing. They say, be holy. And they're, they're so, like I said, they're so caught up on the form that they've left out the function. They may wear their hair in a bun. They may wear the dress that touches the, you know, the ground. They may have all that together but have no love of God for the lost have no peace have no joy so God is teaching the church and he's guiding and instructing us that we need to spend more time in a reflection of him than in who what in, in other words instead of who we think we should be or what scripture and so we get scripture misinterpreted and God is trying to help us presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice is a metaphor the Apostle Paul, remember this, people don't realize that the Apostle Paul was Jewish. They think, well, he's, here he is and he's writing all these, he is Jewish, even though he is a Roman citizen, he is Jewish. In fact, there are some Bible scholars who say the Apostle Paul came from a priestly lineage. That's why he knew so much about Judaism, about the Torah, and the half Torah and about the law of Moses and all this stuff. And so this is something that's very intriguing to me. 
And he writes to these Romans. And so it's a metaphor that he's using. And he's talking about a living sacrifice in terms of bringing sacrifices to the altar of God. So what would happen during that day and time, these Jews, they, the believers, during that day and time, they would pick out their choicest animal, the choicest of their flock. They would bring it to the altar and they would present it as an atonement for the sin. It could be, uh, in some places, it was turtle doves. In some places, it was a lamb. In some places, it was other things, other animals. But that's what this, this person would do. But then Apostle Paul, he's writing to them, and he says, this is a living sacrifice. What you have been bringing to God has been a dead carcass. But I want you to bring a living sacrifice. And so he writes to them, to give themselves up in the spirit of sacrifice. In other words, to be holy, the Lord's property, as the whole burnt offering was, that no part was devoted to any other use. To be holy. It's no wonder I see the church wrestling with needless legalism. It's no wonder there are churches who are fighting one another over legalistic Man-made laws, in other words, views that have no biblical foundation to begin with. God is calling his people to be holy. God is calling his people to get past the form of godliness and function as a holy people. Give the Lord a good hand clap if you believe that to be true. So if we would, if we the body of Christ, if we would spend our energy on the functionality of who we are rather than on what we look like, I believe we'd be more effective than ever before. Think about this. He tells us in Romans 12 and 2 and he continues and he says, be not conformed to this world but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. We may be in this world but we're not to act like this world. And he's telling us, be not conformed to this world there in Romans 12 and verse 2. And so this is, the, this is where, and, and I spoke on it in such, a, in such a powerful way Wednesday evening. And I hope today that I can still translate what I said Wednesday evening to you this morning. The pursuit of this world leads to lust. The pursuit of this world leads to greed. The pursuit of this world leads to pride. The pursuit of this world ultimately will lead all of us to pain. Remember, we are in this world, but we are not of this world, and we're not to act like this world. We're not to conform to this world. Yet we are seeing the church, hello, not just, not gospel lighthouse church, right, but the church down the road, okay, we're seeing a conformity to the things of the world. Now, this is a very dangerous place for the church to be. First of all, the Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a church who has made herself spotless, who has made herself ready as a bride makes herself ready. And second of all, he's coming back to the faithful. And so, James 4 and 4 covers this. And I yet have heard many pastors dare preach on this to the congregation. Because this is, in my assessment, is one of the strongest words for today's believer. James 4 and 4 says this, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. I know there's not a person in this room or person watching live stream that wants to be an enemy with God. There's not a person in this world, I think, intentionally that just wants to be. Now there may be some who want to be an enemy to God, but think about this. And he's telling it, and it's just as plain and simple as it can be. Our, and, and I think that the answer for this is that we, we're guilty of trying to look like the world. 
and act like the world. When God is telling us we're not even of this world, our citizenship is not here. And so what I said Wednesday night was tough, but there's a lot of truth into this. When you look at our culture when it comes to contemporary worship, contemporary worship is beginning to look like the world. And it's hard for some of us to swallow, but it's the honest truth that we want to it become a concert more than a worship experience. Let me tell you something. Just because a person can run and jump and do all those things does not mean that person is worshiping in spirit and truth. All that is is a demonstration of the flesh. When you can gather people in together and you can have zero music and just come before the Lord and lift your hands to heaven and worship him, that is worshiping him in spirit and in truth. What has happened is that we are worshiping the worship music and we are not worshiping the God of worship. And we're so wrapped up in, oh, we have to have the latest song. We have to have the latest style. And the spotlight needs to be on us when the lights have to be off. And all these things have to come together for us to really, truly have a worship experience. Let me tell you something. God's about to change all that. What would happen if there were no lights, no sound, no music? Could you still worship with the same uh, strength, the same passion, the same uh, love and the same hope and same peace? Or would it be a struggle? Would you fight? Would you fold your arms and say, well, I just don't like that song. Or I just don't like the way that beat is, uh, the syncopation. You probably wouldn't use the word syncopation. Only musicians would. But I just don't like the way that sounds. I don't like those words. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm just going to set then your heart is not right and there's an altar for you to come and repent of your sin because all you're doing is worshiping self. God is calling us to be true ambassadors of true worship. How many believe that to be true? It's tough for us to swallow and it's not, I'm not beating the sheep. I will tell you this right now. It is the honest truth. It's time to reevaluate where we are headed as war and in terms of worship. Well, so I think of this and I thought, man, that is such a, that is such a powerful scripture. Friendship of the world is an enemy of God. That's We're in this world. So what do we do? And God said, this is it. I'm going to show you. And by the way, I see a cloud of anointing in here. And this is what I means something good is about to happen to someone. And so God said, this is how you deal with it. This is how you, as a body of Christ, one body, this is how you deal with what's going on in the world. You ready for this? He says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. That happens daily. Every day, your mind needs to be renewed. Renewing your mind on a daily basis. Why? Well, this is why. We must let the inward change produce an outward change. The premise of the book that I've written called the Re uh, uh, Resolving the, the Rule Mentality is this. You cannot change the way people think, but you can challenge people to, th to change the way they, th they think. You can challenge them. Do you, know, no, people, do you know anybody that's just set in their ways and they just think it's this way and it's always going to be this way and it's never going to change, right? But you can challenge people to change. And that's the problem. People just don't want to change. They want to keep it the way it is. But if you will renew your mind every day, you'll be open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, open to his change. This is what Ephesians 4 verse 22 says. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Look at verse 23. It says, and be renewed 
in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's a process that we all must take part in. Renewing our mind, putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And so a message the Lord gave me back in February was called uh, how, the, how the world wants to, it's called to seduce you, to reduce you. I may preach that sometime, but I want to share, you ex share an excerpt from that uh, message. It's what the world wants to do. Wants to seduce you, to reduce you. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Am I right? And so what he does, he wants to steal from you. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. He seduces you to reduce you, to bring you to nothing. Now, I understand a little principle about this because, see, we really are nothing. We need God's leadership. But I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking that you decrease, that Christ will increase in you. I'm talking how the devil's breaking some of you down. And he's doing it in your mind. You know, sometimes we come to the pastor and we pray. And we say, oh, pastor, please pray for me. Please pray for me. I need a new job. And I say, okay. I pray whatever, you know, pastors, whoever they may be. They say, well, okay, we're going to pray God's perfect will. God given it. And so they get a job. And before you know it, the job has got them. And starting to reduce them. And before you know it, they're brought out of church. And they're out of church. Or, Pastor, please pray for me. I need a mate. Anybody know anybody like that? Don't, you don't want me to pray for you. Okay? But if you want somebody, if you want me to pray, I'll, I'll literally pray for you. If you're looking for somebody, I'll pray. I say, God, send the right one. Hello. God's perfect one. Right. I, oh, but I want him to be 6'5", you know, dark hair, handsome, you know, skinny build, strong. Want him to have a lot of money, you know, all those things. It's amazing how we'll ask pastors or leadership to pray for something specific and pray for them. And then when they get that, that specific thing has become their God and has taken them out of church. Hello. Well, maybe we need to evaluate even that how things have been reducing us seducing to reduce exactly what happened with Samson and Delilah seducing to reduce exactly what took place and this is what the world this is what the world wants to do to you reduce you and does it by seducing you look at first John chapter 2 Verse 15, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And it says, the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Well, what's the will of God? I want to do the will of God. How many in here with an uplifted hand can say, Pastor JC, I want to do the will of God. I want to know the will of God. I want to operate in the will of God. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you what the will of God is. Are you ready for this? It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's the will of God. If you are not applying his evident will in your life, you're never going to know his perfect will for your life. So I want to know his perfect will. In fact, don't just learn enough to be dangerous, but learn enough to stay out of danger. There's a lot of people that just learn enough, oh yeah, I've got enough, where to God, I'm a Bible thumper, and I but they're in danger all the time. Right? So... <laughs> I believe that we're not going to be effective if we're dwelling on the things of this world. If I am teaching these, these beautiful young ladies who sing on, Sunday, on, on student services, if I'm teaching them, say, oh yeah, you're going to, you're going to develop into uh, praise and worship, you're going to do all these things, and I'm teaching them things that are not of God, and I'm giving them goals that is not godly, I am doing them wrong. But if I will set them and say, look, 
People are not the audience. God is the audience. And if you worship with all your heart and all your might, regardless if anybody else worships, kind of the display of Pastor Crystal at times, if you will just do this for the glory of God, God is going to bless you. But if I'm trying to get them the next record deal, all of it's wrong. And the intention's wrong. So we got to quit dwelling on what this, this world has to offer. Because we're ineffective. And God has called us to be one body. So this brings me to my life point. And if you'll show this life point this morning, our objective is to be effective. Our objective is to be effective. Let's go on in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. How many is enjoying this teaching today? It says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now look at verse 4. It says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. I want to tell you today, God's word is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. He's just not suggesting. It's not a buffet table. You can pick and choose what you want to do. It is alive, and it is a commandment. So I asked you earlier, and we were reflecting on the anatomy of the human body. But I want us to let, reflect on the anatomy of the body of Christ, the church body, in respect of Gospel Lighthouse Church. Let me ask you now, which part of the human body, or excuse me, which part of the body of Christ gets the most attention? Which part of Gospel Lighthouse Church gets the most attention? Let's look at this in deeper detail. First of all, we said, number one, it's the part that hurts the most. It's the part that hurts the most. We're talking about moving from form to function. Is the person that is hurting the most, are they getting the attention from the body of Christ like they need? Hmm. It's no surprise that hurting people hurt people. There's people today in this room who are hurting. And they hurt people. Not intentionally. It's just because they're wounded. They're hurt. And they may say something or may not say something. They may not be there for you because they themselves are hurting. See, if you're if you injure your foot, you wouldn't cut your foot off and send it to the foot doctor, right? That would be foolish. The Bible says we're one body, right? So when a member of the body is hurting, the entire body is hurting. Hello? I think the reason we're ineffective is it because we're not functioning as the body of Christ. Remember when we take communion, the Apostle Paul says there are some that take it and it's damnation to themselves because they were not worthy. But think about this, the body of Christ. Think about this. Why are some weak? Why are some sick? Talk about in respect of communion. Why? Are we ineffective because we are not functioning the way God has called the body to function? We've let the injured foot stay injured. And when the injured, the, the injured foot is going to go everywhere the body of Christ goes. And when it's injured, it's hurt. And it's going to cause pain to the rest of the body. Especially if it's not dealt with. Look what Galatians 6 and 2 says. It says, bear you one another's burdens and, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Well, let's continue in this examination of the body of Christ. Number two, we said the part that is not functioning properly. 
if the part's not functioning properly, well, in terms of the body of Christ, what part is not functioning properly? Do you even know the offices of the body of Christ? Do you even know the internal principles of the body of Christ? Are we failing somewhere to teach you? So, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 7 says, Woe unto the world because of the offenses. It says, For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Have you ever looked at that scripture and wondered what on earth is Jesus saying? If that's you, hold your hand up so I know who I'm talking to. What on earth is he saying right here? Does he want me to operate with, you know, one hand, one eye? What is going on here? You know, let me think. Let's look at it this way. If you got caught stealing, you wouldn't cut your hand off and send just your hand to jail, right? They don't do that in, in, in America, as far as I know, if he's stealing something and money and gets his hand, all right, we're going to cut your hand off, your hand's going to jail. That doesn't happen. Now, maybe in Haiti and other countries, Muslim countries, maybe that happens. I think they're cutting heads off, though, there, okay, especially in Iran. And so I know some of this happens, but think about that. You're not going to do that if you cause an offense. But if a part of your body isn't functioning properly, you're going to go and you're going to have it checked out with an expert. That's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to find someone expert. I like what Jewish rabbi said about this verse. And this really brings a lot of insight. They are saying it is better for thee to be scorched with a little fire in this world than to be burned with a devouring fire in the world to come. I don't want to go to hell. So when a member of the body is not functioning properly, we need to encourage them and build them up in Christ. Functioning properly. Where is leadership on Wednesday night? Functioning properly. Where are people for board meetings and business meetings? And they say they're signing up and I'll be a part of this, but don't show up. Not functioning properly. What do we do? You kick them while they're down? No. You encourage them. We've been missing you. We've been praying for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know some of you are thinking, well, this is, this is getting tough. But it is God's word. He has called us to be one body. And I'm going to prove to you what he says. Galatians 6 and 1. Let's back this up from verse 2 to, to verse 1. It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, it says, ye which are spiritual. Doesn't mean hyper-spiritual, floating around. Ye who are spiritual, restore. Someone shout, restore. Such a one in the spirit of meekness, consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That word tempted means tested. Consider yourself, lest you go through the same test that they've been going through. Okay, and so it says to restore. And if we're going to be the body of Christ and we're going to function, we need to function in the spirit of reconciliation and in the spirit, the ministry of reconciliation and the spirit of restoration. You believe that? Shout amen. Number three is this one. In terms of the body of Christ, what gets the most attention, we said number three is there's a possibility it's the part that is most visible. The part that is most visible. Which part of the body is the most visible? It's the head. Right? First thing when you see someone walk in a room, you see, you look at them to see who they are. 
You want to know who that person is. It's the head. And so when it comes to the body of Christ, what is most visible is usually the head. And let me tell you something, though. It is the head, which is the most visible, is what usually is the most scrutinized and under attack. It's the one that's seen the most. Have you ever wondered why they fire head coaches and not players? When teams lose, because he's the head coach. He's the most visible. He's the one that's coaching. He's the one, and he's the one that gets fired. And so let me tell you today not just pastors and leadership who are being scrutinized, it is the man of God, the head of the home, the high priest of the home. The husband, the man, the prophet of the home that is under scrutiny in this nation. And we need to pray for all of our men of God. Can I have an amen? They are men of valor. And the devil wants to destroy them. When I began pastoring, I started off prayed for I went on a Thursday, or excuse me, I went on a Friday. And a gentleman in our church, this is years ago, gentleman in our church, he was kind of causing a little problems here and there with some of the voting and the things that were happening. He wasn't necessarily a member, but I knew that he carried a lot of gravity in the church and the people looked up to him. And, uh, well, actually that Sunday night, he sung a song and he said it was called, um, what was the name of that song uh, about God uh, looking out for him? Let's see. Uh, something about having faith in God. I don't remember exactly the name of the song, but anyway, he had a beautiful voice, and this guy could sing, and he was a Sunday school teacher, yet he still wasn't a member yet. And uh, he gave a uh, report that Sunday night before he sang. I don't have to understand. I just need to know his hand. That was the name of the song. I just need to hold his hand. I don't have to understand. I just need to hold his hand. Anyway, he gave a report, and he said... I went to the doctor, and the doctor gave me a great report. I thought, wow. That Friday, I had went and met them and went to go pray with him and make sure everything was good because he knew he had to go to the doctor because he was concerned about something. Well, that was a Sunday night. This was my very first Monday on the job. And so I get a call a little bit before 8 in the morning, and I hear his voice, which I thought it was David Craig. I thought it was Pastor David. I thought he was playing a joke on me because he knew I just started the pastoring. And I hear his voice, and he's saying, pray, brother, pray. And I thought, you know, okay, okay. And I just started praying. I asked him who this was, and he told me, and I realized, okay. <clears throat> and then his wife gets on the, on, the, on the other line, and she says, you know, I just think it's one of those things he's been having, heartburn or something. And I told her, I said, sister, I said, if you think, if it's something with the, with the heart, you need to get to the emergency room as soon as you can or call for an ambulance or something. I didn't know they lived 20 miles out in the forest. And so there's a place called Honey Island right off the Cossatot, uh River, beautiful place. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to meet you out there. Just, just tell me how she, she tried to explain how to get out there, just what roads to take. This is all forest protected roads and uh, warehouser roads. And I'm going down there and I'm trying to find her. Uh, and all of a sudden, I see an ambulance. And I said, oh, well, this must be the same place. And so I'm following this ambulance. And we're just way out there. And all of a sudden, this ambulance comes up to a dead end. I mean, there's no road. I mean, the road just stopped. And he turns around, and so I said, oh, he's lost. And so I'm in the car, and I'm, I'm getting out of the way, and he goes, and he's trying to find this place. And all of a sudden, I see another ambulance come out of this intersection, dirt road, intersection, pine trees all over the place, trying to give you a picture in your mind what it looked like. And then I see her pickup truck following this ambulance. So I said, that is them. So I'm following them, and I mean, they're not doing 50 miles on a dirt road. They're doing 70, 80, 90 miles an hour, this ambulance is, and I can't keep up. I'm in a little Dodge Stratus, 
and I can't even keep up with them. They're just going, this, and I, they know the road, and they know this. So in, I get to the trauma center. I get into the parking lot. I see, I see the lady, uh, the wife. She gets out of her pickup truck, and I walk over to her, and she is just shaking. And I said, hey, I'm here. Let's pray. Let's, let's go. And see, she says, she says, I don't know, Brother Seward. I just don't know, Brother Seward. And I said, okay, okay. Now, this gentleman had just sung a song Sunday night. And so here I am, and I get into the trauma center, and there are doctors and nurses and uh, EMTs all around. There's about seven or eight people around this bed, and he has turned blue. He looks at me, and he's saying, pray, Pastor, pray. And so I'm new on a job. I don't even know this family. I don't know anyone. And I put my hand on his hand, and I start praying. And all of a sudden, I hear the doctor say clear. And as soon as they, he began to say clear, a nurse grabbed my hand and threw it off of his hand. I, I mean, this is happening so fast. I didn't realize what was going on. And then they shock him, and they try for several minutes to bring him back. And they fail. He dies. And I think to myself, wow, Lord, this is big. And the doctor looks at me, and there's seven or eight people in there. And I didn't know at the time his nephew was an EMT. He was in there. The doctor says, who's the pastor? Are you the pastor? And I say, yeah, I'm the pastor. He says, go out there and tell his wife that we can't bring him back, that he has just died. I didn't even know her. And so I walk out of that trauma center and I just look at her and shake my head. And she falls into my arms. And by that time, other family members were showing up. It was devastating. It was horrific. It was hard. And during that time, no, I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my league. I'm out of my element. I was youth pastor. I'm going to go back and be a youth pastor, eat pizza and play keyboard. It's got to be a lot better than this. During that time, pastoring, in two weeks' time, we had three deaths in our church. One right after the other. I had a pastor from Van Buren call me, and he said, Pastor J.C., do me a favor, don't pray for me because I want to live. <laughs> I know he was joking, but I said, come on. He said, I just want you to know we're right here. We're here if you need to talk. But during that funeral, a pastor came to me, and he said something to me and these board members that were from this church I was pastoring. And he said something to me that I have never forgotten. He said it to me, and he said it to those board members, and he said this. And I want you to hear this. He said, if you will take care of God's man, God's man's God will take care of you. I have never forgotten that. I'll be honest with you. There were times pastoring everywhere I've went, wondering if people really are buying into the vision, really taking care of their pastor. There were times that I've wondered about that. I'm human. But I've realized the same advice that I give to the praise team is the same advice that I have to take. Get my eyes off the people and the eyes on the person. When I do that, I renew my mind every day. Renew my mind every day. Hebrews 13 and 17 says, we're about, to, we're about to close. It says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Who is the writer of Hebrews talking about? He's talking to the congregation 
about the pastor. And the head may be the most visible and it may be getting a lot of attention because the head is looking out for the souls of the people. So my question for you this morning is this, are you effective? Our life point is, our objective is to be effective. Are you effective? Are you? I'm not talking about somebody else. I'm not talking about Pastor Jennifer. I'm talking about Pastor, or, or talking about specifically Pastor Crystal or Kevin. I'm not singling anybody out. I'm talking about you. Are you an effective part of the body of Christ. Are you in effect? Our objective is to be effective. You know what's going to happen? Next couple of months, we're going to see how effective we really are as a body of Christ. Am I right, Brother Kevin? And we're going to be put to test. And we're going to see, are we truly the prayer warriors that God has called us to pray? Are we truly the ambassadors? Are we truly the teachers, the elders, the deacons, the, the men, the women of God, the children, the students, all of us? Are we truly the effective body of Christ? And the only way that we can ever answer that question is by being challenged. And I believe God is going to allow us to be challenged. And the reason he challenges us is to get us in shape. Right? So how do I apply this to my life? So what and now what? How do I go from auditing this message to applying it? How can I make this message one body count for life? I believe the most efficient way to make true application of this message is to realize how important it is for the body of Christ to be one body. There's not one little section here and one little section here. It is the beautiful picture of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. When we get to heaven, I heard a pastor preaching this week and he was talking about, well, there's not going to be any, you know, Baptists on this side and Pentecost in the back because they're so loud and, uh, you know, Lutheran and all these other things. He's, he didn't say, no, we're, we're one body. We're the bride of Christ. So I think the most efficient way to do this to be effective is to realize how important it is for us to be one body. Listen to what 1 Timothy 4 and 8 says. It says, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Apostle Paul is telling young Timothy, don't spend all your energy on form. But spend your energy on function. Be godly. Stand together with us this morning. If we would put more time into our body, into the body of Christ as we do our own bodies, right? I believe we'd function the way that God has called us to function. So, what if we all determine before I leave this room, what if we all determine to function properly? That if, you're, if you have a role and the church is honoring that role, whether, whether by finances or just honoring the title, that you're going to do your best to fulfill that role. You'll be here earlier. You'll be part of it and you'll serve with joy. I was telling our What's Next class this morning, I said, my grandmother Brown always said, just grin and bear it. Maybe that's what I have to do, just grin and bear it sometimes. Just get through this season. God will, you know, we move from surviving to thriving. Let's change our perspective. Let's renew our mind. Let me tell you something. It's not all about you. It's all about him. Am I right? What if we determine to function properly? How would that affect you, your family, your job? How would that affect the church? How would it affect the community? Imagine with me, Blytheville, a church in Blytheville that is functioning in an effective way. Can you imagine being a church and being accused of turning a city 
upside down. They did in the day of Acts. It shouldn't be any different today. Take your neighbor by the hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for this word. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity this morning to pastor Gospel Lighthouse Church. Beautiful, intelligent, very spiritual people. We've had our ups, we've had our downs. But God, we know you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as we take this first step to truly becoming one body, God, you will bless and you will honor and you will put your stamp of approval upon us and you will anoint us. And as we operate as one body, your glory is going to come in a greater magnitude, more so than we've ever seen. We're not going to have to drive seven hours to see your glory. Your glory is going to be here in this place in greater magnitude. And we thank you for that. We give you glory and honor. While your head is bowed and your eyes closed, you say, Pastor JC, today this message has stirred my heart, has challenged me. And I've asked myself, I don't find a place where I fit in the body of Christ I don't find that place but I want to I want I want to know today that I'm a body of Christ that I'm a part of this body not just gospel lighthouse church but the whole body of Christ I want to find and discover and it's going to be through the grace and the mercy of God that I can find that my purpose for the body of Christ if that's you, just hold your hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor JC. I see your hands. I see hands being raised. Pray for me, Pastor JC. I want to discover my purpose. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for people today that have their hands raised and are saying, God, I want to know my purpose. I want to discover that. I want to be exactly what you want to be. I want to follow your will your perfect will for my life. Father, I pray, God, that you would guide them and direct them, Holy Spirit. You have free course and liberty to just begin to unveil to them purpose and destiny for their lives and as they fit in the body of Christ. We thank you for that today, and we give you the glory, and we give you the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. While your head is bowed, I have a word of, a word of the Lord for someone. God is saying that you are in a transition. It's, a, it's over your job. It's over a job that you, you have right now. I don't know who you are, but I, I'm hearing what the Lord is saying. God is saying you are in transition. And you've been praying, God, do I need to keep this job? Do I need to, what do I need to do about this employment? And God says this. This is what the Lord says. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He has already ordered your steps. He has already opened the door. But he wants you to stand still and wait upon him. For the answer is just nigh unto you. It's near to you. But wait upon the Lord, and he's going to guide and direct you for your next move. Thank you, Father. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap. Lift our hands toward heaven. Let's say our Arionic Kohenim blessing. First in Hebrew, Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you and give you peace. Arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness of the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. You believe that? Shout hallelujah. One more time, give the Lord a good hand clap. God bless you. You're dismissed. Shake hands. Get married. We'll see you at 5 o'clock.